I want to start with Amy Verone. Amy is one of my favorite people. We share an affinity for Roosevelt and Roosevelt's 193 journey across the American West. Uh, Amy is the chief of, of cultural um, studies at Sagamore Hill, which is, as you know, the great mother load of Roosevelt, Diana, and Valerie Naylor and I have had a chance to go to Sagamore Hill a couple of times and to work with Amy and others there on the digitization of the Theodore Roosevelt papers at Sagamore. And Amy has an open invitation to come back here as often as she wants. Uh, she's going to talk for a few minutes about uh, life in the White House, uh, life above the shop, life above the store for the Roosevelt. But I should just tell you that she had a Rooseveltian experience in getting here. <laughs> she, she flew to Bismarck yesterday to be with us and was uh, rented a car to drive to Dickinson to be at the opening um, little dinner that we had last night for the presenters. And halfway from Bismarck to Dickinson, she had a flat tire. And so, well, luckily, everything worked out all right. But, uh, but Rosa would be proud of you for persevering through that little, that little crisis. <laughs> anyway, let's begin with Life Above the Store. Thank you for Thank you. talking to you about the Roosevelt in the White House. <laughs> Somewhat less happy when he was like two hours knowing. Um, I'm going to talk first about uh, what was probably the most important achievement of the Roosevelt's while they were in the White House, and that was to oversee the renovation of the building. Uh, the White House is both a family space and, of course, a public space. And uh, in its position as sort of the, the nation's face to the world. Uh, Washington has a big impression on uh, foreign visitors, foreign diplomats, sort of the, the uh, structural face to go with the empire that these uh, folks talked about earlier today. The cornerstone of the White House was laid in, 19, in 1792. It was designed by jo James Hoban, an Irish immigrant who worked with George Washington uh, to lay out the initial design. What I find fascinating about the White House is that every person who's lived there has changed it. Um, of course, the biggest change for the White House came in 1812 when the British burned it. Uh, the structure itself did survive, the stone, the stone exterior, but the entire uh, inside was gutted, but rebuilt, obviously, uh, and improved. By the 1920s, it had these colonnades added on either side of the building to provide uh, sort of formal entry to the building, guests would come and walk up one of the colonnades to, usually to the east side. Uh, by the 19, 1860s, when Lincoln was president, um, they had started adding conservatories on the west side of the building, um, mainly for entertainment and to have parties, to grow some food for the house, but really just for entertainment. I find it fascinating that uh, the country's at war at this time, and yet there is no fence on the White House. There's nothing to keep people out. And throughout the, 17th, the entire 18th century, 19th century rather, the White House is treated as a public park by the citizens of Washington, D.C. And even into the 1890s, um, the, fact the place was unfenced. After two assassinations of presidents, the place, place was unfenced. It was not until one of these visitors walked into the family garden area and picked uh, the Cleveland's baby, baby Ruth up out of her carriage that a fence was put up. And uh, when it, the, there began to be limitations in the access to the house. Uh, 1900, they had been talking there had been talk in Washington uh, for more than 10 years about renovating the White House, just both in terms of upgrading family space but more importantly, looking at the ceremonial purposes of the house. Uh, the Congress allotted half a million dollars for this project, and uh, they selected Charles McKinn, who was the head architect of the New York firm McKinn, Mead & White, to come and do the actual design. This is uh, Charles McKinn in the middle uh, with his partners, uh, William Mead and Stanford White. They worked with Mrs. Roosevelt. They did not work with the president. He was busy running the country, and she worked with them both in planning the family spaces, 
but in looking at the functional uh, necessities that the White House lacked at the time. This is the uh, first floor of the White House. Any of us who have watched West Wing probably seen this. Basically, visitors could come in through the North Portico into a vestibule, the East Room, which of course is, is very famous, the color rooms in the back, and then a state dining room and a family dining room here also. This is the uh, portico, the vestibule as it looks, in right at 1900. Uh, as I mentioned, every president had left a mark on the house. And in the 1870s, Chester Arthur, that uh, New Yorker, had hired the New York firm of Tiffany and Company to design uh, stained glass windows for the entrance hall, which actually prevented people from seeing into the other hallways and the other rooms. This is a color illustration that gives you an idea of the impact that that had. By 1900, this was considered old-fashioned. It was out of sync with what they were looking for in the White House. Um, with McKim leading the project and Mrs. Roosevelt's input, the renovation of the White House basically uh, was done in conjunction with something called the Macmillan Plan. Washington, D.C. in uh, 1900 was basically a cesspool, uh, which is a rude thing to say. Streets were unpaved. Open, they had open sewers around the White House and the mall. Um, it was considered a hardship posting for the diplomatic corps. The British, uh, especially, they had permission to wear tropical outfits and shorts because uh, the weather was so beastly. And this was mainly because Congress only met uh, in Washington from uh, in like October through May. Once the summer started coming, Congress adjourned and they left town, and it was just the citizens who had to suffer through the city. It wasn't until, uh, I think it's 18, 1916, when Woodrow Wilson kept the Congress in session all summer, and they had to sit through July and August in Washington while they considered the income tax legislation, that they finally came to the realization and admitted, yes, something had to be done and we had to spend money on upgrading the city. There was still concern, uh, the Macmillan plan was an effort by Congress to look at the layout of the city and to figure out how to make a ceremonial city that was worthy of these dreams of empire and worthy of you know, competition with European capitals. So what they did, instead, you know, there were actually people who were saying, we should go to palace to the president, uh, you know, copying Versailles. Uh, there were people who said, no, no, that's a bad idea. And, and what they came up with was the idea of classical architecture, a neoclassical Greek revival style, uh, hearkening back to the Greek democracy and, and that, how its ideals could represent the United States in this new era. So as you can see, it's quite a change from the uh, previous sort of arcade amusement park look <laughs> to the uh, classical entry hall. And, and this is the style that the White House has really been kept in the last century. This is a picture of the East Room, uh, which of course is the main ceremonial space. Theo Roosevelt rather famously remarked that it looked like the lobby of the Willard Hotel, which was just down the street. And uh, this is the lobby of the Willard Hotel. <laughs> And you can see, yes, it does look just like that. So um, it too got a uh, sort of Grecian revival uh, redo, and they took out the stuffed furniture, they opened the space up, and it's become very adaptable. That, that they can move tables in for presentations, they can move seating in. Mrs. Roosevelt instituted a series of musical events, and uh, they were adjustable as, as they needed to be for whatever the program was offered. Oh, this is a frightening picture of the blue room, which is an oval room. It's one of the little reception rooms in the back, along with the green room and the red room. And it got, I think it was the most in need of a revival. So. And um, it's much more lovely in these uh, colored postcards. I do have to confess, this is a red room. And it was also redone in the 1870s by Tiffany and Company. And I like this. I think they should have kept this, but they didn't. They, they went revival on us and uh, started putting in portraits of the presidents and the first ladies throughout the first floor. This, again, looks like the Willard Hotel. It is the East Room. 
And at the time that the Roosevelt's moved in, it only held 60 people for dinner. Obviously, that's not a very big state dinner. And again, they opened up the space. They took out a, a wall between a hallway and such to expand the room. And it would seat over 100. Of course, uh, one of the few areas that TR got anything he wanted was in the decoration of the state dining room. And that is with the hunting trophies, which were his hunting trophies. Um, we have a close up to some of them. I particularly like the bear. He looks very happy to be there at dinner at the White House. But uh, there were some people who did not approve. And this was a commentary in the newspaper. You'll notice that all, all of the animals have TR's face. So he said that he would, he would eat anyone who came to dinner. This is the, the family dining room, which is the last main room on, on the first floor there. And uh, you can see the lovely wallpaper that was put in, I think it's by Mrs. McKinley. Uh, but that room also got a facelift. But I think the most amazing thing at the end of the renovation was that all of the rooms looked alike. They were actually matched fairly well throughout the building. Just going to give you a quick look at the second floor. We're not actually going to visit the second floor. But you can see this is the problem. This is where Mrs. Roosevelt felt that they were living among, above the store. Here are family bedrooms on, on the uh, west side of the building. And here are uh, government offices, basically, on the east side of the building. Uh, the press would come and hang out in the hall and talk to the kids, as you know, the kids were playing. Uh, foreign dignitaries uh, were often the targets of the Roosevelt children and their spitballs, which was also not, not a plus. And uh, they didn't really change the rooms up here much. Mrs. Roosevelt simply shut them all out. And all of the government functions were removed from the upstairs and moved to the new wing. Uh, this is the White House. You can see those colonnades, which were really ornamental earlier, became actual wings. This is the East Wing. It became a formal greeting area for the public. Uh, previously, carriages had just come by and dropped people off at the end of the colonnade, and they'd walk in, and no one, there was not enough cloakroom, there was no one to organize the uh, coming and going with visitors. This new East Wing actually had a series of cloakrooms. It had an electronic uh, connection to the stables where the carriages were parked. And so as guests would depart, they could actually send a note, you know, send a message to the uh, stables of which carriage should be brought up in what order. So that it brought a lot of order and function to the White House. <coughs> it's really on the West Wing uh, that we are most familiar with the White House now. It's even serves to define it for us. When the Roosevelt's moved in, there were these large conservatories, and uh, they've been built in various stages uh, since the 1840s. Uh, they were all disassembled. There was, you know, hue and cry in the newspaper that, oh, they were wasted and they were thrown at the Potomac or something, but they weren't. They were reassembled at different places in Washington, D.C. You can still, if you go to uh, Washington today, visit one of these conservatories. It's right by the reflecting pole below the Capitol. And uh, most of them were shipped off to the National Arboretum. But they put in new office buildings, new office structures. And this became the formal West Wing. The executive office building um, housed the president and his cabinet uh, meeting spaces that housed his clerk's offices. Which I'll show it to you as long as I'm talking about it. Staff areas. And you'll notice that the president's office, which is over in that far corner, is not oval. The oval office doesn't come into the White House until uh, the William Taft administration. And uh, even five years after the Roosevelt's expanded the space, uh, the workspace, they needed more workspace. And so Taft expanded it. And what he covered up was, oh, I'm sorry, this is a image of the White of the President's office. But what Taft covered up was Theodore Roosevelt's tennis court. That uh, Mrs. Roosevelt was concerned that the President would just basically sit around too much. And so she actually told people when they came to visit him to go outside and get tennis balls with him. So he would meet diplomats, he would meet uh, government officials out hitting tennis balls back and forth on this uh, sandy court outside the uh, office. His door was 
just out of sight over there, but you could go directly out there. You could also bother all the staff and get tennis balls against their windows. Just not funny. His, his uh, unofficial advisors, his just sort of friends in the White House and newspaper men, they were actually known as the tennis court cabinet. So they would come and hang out and talk with them behind the scenes the way FDR would later have a kitchen cabinet who used to come and sit and eat ice cream in the kitchen. But uh, when they left the White House, uh, these group of friends got together and they gave him this sculpture of a cougar climbing a man named Alexander Proctor. I just want you to keep that in mind uh, for later. Mrs. Roosevelt ran not just the White House, but she ran Washington Society in her position as First Lady. And speed up just a little because I know who is looking at me already. Life in the White House is very formal. And you know, there were invitations for any and everything. You didn't just drop in on the president anymore. You couldn't just you know, jump over the fence and come in. You'd get arrested, which is a good thing, probably. Um, but there were lots of it. They were entertained all the time. And there were formal invitations to everything, whether it was a steak dinner or a ball or even a garden party. And this is a uh, view of the garden party at the South Lawn. The president, you know, if he went somewhere, he went in a carriage with a livery um, coachman and footman. He didn't just uh, go out and visit his friends anymore. I know this is going to be upsetting to a lot of people here, but T.R. loved riding, as we all know. And he did go riding almost every day, certainly several times a week. But he did not choose to wear to use a western saddle. He didn't wear cowboy boots. He wore formal riding attire. And, and you can see it almost in the picture. He wore John first, and he wore a variety coat. He had a blanket with his initials engraved on it for the horse. Even worse, um, guests who went along with him received a little card. There was a protocol instructions. You know, rules, rules of the road for riding with Roosevelt. And he literally got handed a little card, and it said things like, whoever the president chooses to sp speak to uh, must ride on his left, slightly behind him, the right stirrup, you know, behind the president's left stirrup. When the president was done talking to, with you, you were to fall back, and, you know, the next person would come up and take your place. It was a very formal... Uh, sort of activity, which, which I know isn't really keeping in the North Dakota stuff. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show you who lived in the White House, of course. This is Edith Roosevelt and her husband, Theodore Roosevelt. These are portraits by Francis Benjamin Johnson, who was a Washington Society photographer, um, had great access to the White House from the 1870s uh, into the 1910s. Alice Roosevelt with her brother, uh, Ted, that's Ted with Eli the Blue Macaw, who was one of innumerable pets who lived in the White House. Um, Kermit with Jack Dog, who was Edith Roosevelt's favorite dog of the dozens that they had. His sister Ethel. Um, Archie Roosevelt on his bicycle, and then Quentin Roosevelt, who was sitting on Archie's pony, Algonquin. Algonquin made the news. Uh, he's the pony that got to ride the elevator in the White House that the White House staff loved the Roosevelt kids um, and had no problems helping them sneak the pony upstairs to visit Archie when he was sick and helping in their other little uh, escapades. This is actually my favorite White House portrait. <laughs> this is Jack on a bench in the yard of the White House and William Kleindings, who was a Washington Society photographer and took lots of pictures of TR. One of the times when he came and photographed the president in the White House Mrs. Roosevelt had to go out and photograph Jack in the yard. Um, I just, you know, obviously Jack deserved this portrait. <laughs> formal portraits. There were formal portraits done of the uh, Roosevelt's in the White House that are in the collection now. This is a portrait of Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, painted by Cecilia Bow, a Philadelphia portrait painter. And you'll notice her daughter Ethel is in the picture. And Ethel was not supposed to be in the picture, but Ethel just kept coming and sitting with her mother and sitting with her mother and sitting with her mother and getting in the painter's way, basically. So she added her to the painting. And right, Edie, before you go on, can I ask about the tusk? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. This is, a, this is the north room at Sagamore Hill. This is a room that was added in 1905, mainly for the company. 
Uh, the short tusk is one of the uh, elephants that TR shot in Africa on his safari in 1909 and 10. The taller tusk is a uh, 10 foot, one of a 10 foot high pair of tusks we have that were a gift to him from the uh, King of Siam, actually. Uh, we bought this portrait uh, about 15 years ago. We were able to borrow it for a while from uh, the family. It's still in the family, instead of in my conscious at Sagamore Hill. This is uh, the official portrait of the president, painted by John Singer Sargent. And uh, talk about annoyed portrait painters. Apparently, Sargent kept annoying TR all day because TR was used to sort of being the man in charge. And he had Sargent following him around. And at first, they posed in the Oval Office behind the desk. And then he didn't like those sketches. Then he posed him outside. He didn't like those sketches. Then he posed him in, upstairs in the hall. He didn't like those sketches. And so TR was going to be coming downstairs to a meeting. And Sargent was coming back in to uh, paint him some more. And TR just sort of slammed his hand down and said, aren't you done yet? And uh, Sargent said, that's it. Hold that pose. And uh, so he painted him uh, on the steps of the White House. Now, just one quick diversion, and then we'll then now stop. To go back to that uh, state dining room, you can't tell. The postcard's not clear enough, and I, and I couldn't find a picture of them. But here on the White House, uh, here on the mantle, there are lion's heads. You know, lions are very conventional in architecture. They show up a lot as decoration. And uh, TR didn't like them. He didn't think we should be using lions for architecture in the United States because there aren't any African lions roaming freely in America, or there shouldn't be any. Um, he actually said that he knew it was convention, but he thought that we shouldn't follow convention because it, when it was silly. And uh, even though he's a loyal New Yorker, TR did not like the, the great lions that are in front of the New York Public Library. He said they looked like they were having an epileptic fit. And that they were a disgrace to Fifth Avenue. And trust me, New York, that can get you wish. Uh, in the unfortunately worse sense of the word. What he did like with Buffalo, as you all know, of course. And we have a number of Buffalo. This is a Buffalo head. It's in the north room at Sagamore Hill. It's one of two on either side of the fireplace. We also have uh, buffalo art throughout the house. Um, this little statue, which he bought at Tiffany's, is actually sitting on a bookcase positioned so that he could look up from his desk. And it, it sat in front of a portrait of Mrs. Roosevelt, which is his favorite portrait of her, so he could look at his love and his buffalo at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, right, we've lost the last two slides. What happened was that TR went to that man, Proctor, who had done the earlier uh, mountain lion statue. And he said, I don't like these lions, and I want to see them replaced. So when he had objected to the lions, Edith and Charles and Kim both laughed at him. But he had Proctor carved buffalo heads and cut out the marble lion heads from the safe dining room fireplace and put the buffalo heads in, in their place. And apparently on the last day of his administration, on March 4th, 1909, as they were leaving the White House, he said, oh, Edie, I have something to show you. And marched her into the state dining room and showed her that he had put his buffalo there. So, anyway, I'm sorry, you don't see the picture. Right. First of all, thank you very much, Amy. Please take that stool with you if you have sticks to the ground because of the paint. But uh, we so appreciate Amy's the Chief of Cultural Resources at Sagamore Hill. Your boss is here too. Yes, my uh, boss is here. He's hiding in the back. There he is. Up. He's the superintendent of, of Sagamore Hill. We're glad to be here. I just want to say one word about sculpture. Um, you know, Proctor has two TR sculptures in North Dakota. Uh, one is the equestrian Roosevelt at, up in Minot at Roosevelt Park. You've probably seen it if you've been to the State Fair, but there's a, a equestrian statue of TR in Minot. And then there's a miniature of that same equestrian statue in Mandan, in front of the old uh, 
MP Depot, where the Five Nations Art uh, Gallery is. That's a miniature of Proctor. Proctor was a very prolific sculptor. And the other large-scale equestrian, identical to the one that's in Minot, is in downtown Portland at Roosevelt Park there, in front of Roosevelt Hotel. So Proctor is a very big deal. But let me just quickly, before we get to Steve Doherty, say this much. Next year, we at Nickinson at the Roosevelt Center are hosting the National Theodore Roosevelt Association annual meeting. That's the group of Roosevelt lovers and advocates um, who live all over the world, and they gather once a year in October to celebrate Theodore Roosevelt. And Dickinson State, uh, largely the work of Sharon Kilzer, applied to the TRA that they would come here next fall for their annual meeting. And we were delighted to, to discover that they agreed. So they're all coming here a little bit later, but next year uh, at this time. And we'll be hosting them, and we'll be doing some of the activities out in Medora and many of them here. We have a couple of very special things we want to do. Let me just tell you about one, because it, uh, Amy's talked about sculpture reminded me of this. Well, on the 4th of July, uh, 1886, Theodore Roosevelt came to Dickinson, and he delivered the 4th of July oration here. You, you're probably aware of that. Um, I regard that as his first great national speech. That's the one where he said, like all Americans, I like big things, big prairies, big forests and mountains, big wheat fields and railroads and herds of cattle to big steamboats and factories and everything else. It was a big speech about America's physical greatness, and he then said, of course, with that physical sublimity comes a moral responsibility that we become a nation equal to the, uh, the mountains and the rivers and the grandeur of this continent. He gave that speech here at Dickinson, when Dickinson was just a village. In fact, it was the first ever Fourth of July celebration in Dickinson. And that speech was delivered. So what we wanted to know was, where did he deliver the speech? Well, thanks to um, our own staff, uh, we have discovered, uh, it was um, Carl Larson, an emeritus professor of English here, who discovered that uh, the speech was actually delivered on what's now the county courthouse lawn. So where you know where the beautiful Stark County Courthouse is, I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture in Western North Dakota, right there on the southwest corner of that lawn was the spot where Roosevelt delivered that speech. So what we're going to do when the TRA comes is unveil a sign, a plaque, and we hope uh, the first pedestrian statue of Roosevelt in North Dakota. There is an equestrian statue, but there's no pedestrian statue of him just standing. And so we're going to have a competition and we're going to have a pedestrian, slightly larger than life statue of Roosevelt, but it will be commissioned for him in 1886 as a young man, not as the adult Roosevelt, but as this young, somewhat greedy, uh, maverick cowboy. And we're going to then unveil that statue and that sign and that plaque uh, in cooperation with the city of Dickinson, Stark County, and the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson uh, State University. It'll be the first pedestrian statue of Roosevelt in North Dakota. It'll be the only statue of Roosevelt from that era, from the 1880s. And so that's going to be a huge and wonderful feature of next year's uh, Theodore Roosevelt Symposium. So to put that on the calendar the last week in October, and Dickinson will have something really extraordinary to show. Now, on to Assistant Professor of Political Science, Stephen Doherty. Stephen Doherty is going to come up here and give us a few minutes on Roosevelt and the Square Deal. Professor Doris. Thank you, Craig. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the square deal. Uh, some of you are familiar with this term. Uh, some of you might, uh, this might be the first time you've encountered it. Uh, I think the square deal can be thought of uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, Roosevelt's a basic domestic program. I hope in this presentation you can discuss in specifics some of what Roosevelt achieved as president some of the legislation, some of the programs, some of the objectives he wished to achieve. But the very name of it, square deal, indicates something else. Uh, a square deal, namely <coughs> an agreement between governments and the individual, that the individual might have a fair shot. Uh, Roosevelt sees this not just in, term of, in terms of specific programs and uh, that sort of thing, but more in terms of uh, these programs will allow each and every American in his view, 
chance to achieve, the chance to take advantage of their uh, skills and abilities and to, uh, and to make the most of their life. That's at least the way he uh, perhaps envisioned it. He, he first uses it in his 1903 campaign. He first uses the term, from what I understand, they're running for office and it was very successful. Uh, candidacy for presidency. As you know, his first term had come at the death of William McKinley. His second term he earned in a very successful re-election campaign. Uh, before I get into the square deal, though, I'd like to just uh, speak for a few minutes about why Theodore Roosevelt and his policies are so important. Why is it we're having this, uh, uh, this uh, symposium? I would ask uh, all the people who came, and thank you for coming. How many of you would be excited about coming to a Lillard film <laughs> Uh, or in G. Hardy weekend or something like that. I don't know if you'd be here. Uh, I don't quite, uh, in some ways, I don't think they achieved some of the things, things that Roosevelt did, and that's why we honor him, and that's why we have uh, such, such a focus of attention on him. What makes him such worthy of this status, though? Uh, we're going to create a story that's here, uh, discussing some of the specifics of his life and, and things like that, but as a political scientist, I'm always interested in what uh, Theodore Roosevelt did to the institution of presidency. How did he change American politics? Uh, I think he was basically the right person at the right time. Uh, I think he had the right qualities and the right concepts of, of leadership uh, to accompany a whole lot of uh, social change, economic change, and things that were happening at that particular time. Uh, some of these qualities included simply his gift for leadership and his talent for innovation. Uh, Roosevelt was, in some ways, unlike perhaps the individuals I discussed before, just a great person for the purpose of getting people to follow him, and he cultivated that. He was wonderful at uh, gestures and activities and the, create, the creation of a persona that people wanted to follow. He had that particular skill. He knew it. He was rather egotistical and wanted to start with. And uh, he knew the dramatic gesture, the waving of the sombrero, the, uh, the bold speech, the, the, the smile, all the things that he uh, was able to do there. He had that sort of gift of, of leadership, the, the need for people to follow him. Uh, and he cultivated it with some of the, the grandiose things he did in his life. He charged up San Juan Hill, uh, come out here to the West. Come out here to the West and, and associate himself with the West at a time when most people were beginning to move away from kind of uh, physical activities and strenuous activities. He kind of regales in it. That uh, creates a, an attractive persona. Another thing about him was he was a, a great innovator. And this is another part of being a leader. Uh, if I, you know, Perry Arnold doesn't scream copyright at me because I actually got some of this information from his book. Uh, some of the things he did as president were new and exciting and interesting. He was the first one to manipulate the mass media. He had press conferences. He would also consult excellent uh, uh, social scientists, uh, bring them to the White House, find new policies, find new ways of approaching things. So he had this sort of grand ability at innovation. Uh, he also, I think, was very, very uh, capable of grasping the world around him, especially the social and economic change that was taking place. Roosevelt takes over uh, at a time of the turn of the century. When that particular you know, kind of calendar issue is accompanied by just a, a massive change in American economy, American society, and the world, technology, and all these sorts of things. So he has this ability to truly grasp the world around him. Uh, I always maybe use a caveman metaphor. You know, at some point in our uh, prehistoric history, there was a caveman who knew what the man's looked like. He knew where to throw the spear. He knew how to cut it and skin it and turn it into uh, something that his tribe could eat. And he was probably greatly honored because of that. And I think in some ways, Roosevelt knew how to deal with the, the struggles of his time the great mammoth of his time. Now, some of these uh, new forces uh, include, and I think they would all culminate with what we would call kind of a progressive movement, uh, first of all, a maturing economy. This is a time when America is industrializing, reaching the point in its industrialization where the kind of unlimited growth that we saw in the past, the uh, amount of, uh, of just kind of carving up the wilderness and harvesting natural resources and just doing those things, is beginning to mature. It's beginning, the economy is kind of uh, getting more consolidated around a few industries, and uh, not as much wild growth as you're seeing uh, uh, in earlier times. That has to be dealt with. He's also dealing with a much more educated and literate and informed population. And there had been educational reform. There had been more people seeking education, learning to read, paying attention to politics, paying attention to government having their informed views on what government can achieve. So he's, he's dealing with a different type of person. 
Uh, previous to this, I don't know if as many people have been interested in politics or capable of reading about it. Uh, his literacy was not that high. Uh, we had a different population at this time. We also see an active labor movement at this time. Working people are beginning to affiliate and organize to press employers. Uh, this phenomenon is happening around the world, it's happening in the United States, and this is something Roosevelt is dealing with. And he's, in a general sense, dealing with it in a larger middle class. Previous to this, society had been rather simple. And there's some wealthy individuals who have the wealth, and a lot of, uh, under, we call it the other class, and not very wealthy people who uh, simply kind of uh, try to survive. We have now a middle class. We have uh, individuals not of either of those classes beginning to become more literate, beginning to assert themselves beginning to start to make demands on politics and government. Roosevelt sees these people, senses these people, and sees the possibility of utilizing these people to create a new presidency, a new type of political party, just a whole new approach to government. This is part of his genius. This is part of what he, he sees. Uh, this progressive movement, Roosevelt will be part of it and will attempt to harvest it for purposes of both changing the country and also empowering himself politically using these folks uh, as a way of uh, creating a, a, a powerful uh, you know, place for himself, a powerful new platform for the president. Uh, what were some of the things that were needed to be acted on with, with the square deal? Uh, obviously, concentrated wealth was a major issue. Uh, this uh, still was a time where there was a huge amount of wealth invested in new people. Think of J.P. Morgan, think of Andrew Carnegie. Think of people like that who literally had uh, billions of dollars, and many people still had a very meager income at this time. And so you had this concentrated wealth. J.P. Morgan famously had to carry him to the stock exchange and an indication of just the amount of power, the amount of, of concentrated wealth he had. This is something the middle class is demanding some changes on, and this is something Roosevelt is seeing potential, great potential in dealing with these issues. Also, the development of monopolies in a similar vein. Much of the economy was uh, concentrated around a few large companies, U.S. Steel. And there were all of these companies that, duck, comp that had a monopoly that is no competition. They completely dominated these particular industries because it happened in the economy for decades before that. And this is uh, preventing wealth from being spread around to as many people as Roosevelt would like see. But also, he sees in it no competition. Roosevelt being the person who believes in the square deal, the equal chance. He likes the idea of people getting an opportunity to take advantage of their skills and achieve all that they can achieve. And monopolies are, of course, definitely trust, sometimes they're called, definitely a challenge to that. So he, he sees that as a, a serious problem. Also, this is a time in our history when we're starting to see more pollution, environmental degradation. We're starting to see uh, the negative consequences of industrial development. We're starting to see water pollution. Forest being stripped, things like that. I think some of the other panelists might uh, uh, mention this as well. But it's happening, and at least we're perceiving it. People become more aware of it. Uh, and of course, Roosevelt, as you know, obviously nature, so we enjoy nature and, and hunting and things like that, uh, has a sense about this. But he knows that this is also becoming a major concern. Uh, we're also seeing at this time uh, mass produced goods. Uh, we're going into this uh, type of economy that's producing more consumer goods. In 1800, um, people probably produce most of their own clothing, most of the things they need to live. Uh, you're starting, they caught and grew their own food. Now we're starting to see these mass-produced products, such as food, drugs, things like that. Uh, these are not always being produced in the most the safe, cleanly way. Uh, there's a great book at this time you're quite familiar with, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, the uh, horrific uh, account of what life was like working in uh, the Chicago stockyards and people eating the products that came out of that. Uh, so this is another one of those particular problems that uh, Roosevelt sees at the time. Uh, so Roosevelt, running for office in 1904, makes these his major issues, makes these kind of the major focus of his promise to the voters. And when in power, he will successfully push through many of these uh, programs. Uh, some of them include the Food and Drug Act. The first act that deals with those unsafe consumer products, that deals with the uh, shoddy medicine, the uh, bad food, the tainted food, the, the unsafe consumer products that's passed to Roosevelt's first term. Now, he also strengthens the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, 
Uh, it is the first antitrust organization. It's the first uh, kind of business and economic regulatory agency that we have in the country. Roosevelt uh, makes it much stronger than it has before. It empowers it to take more action against monopolies, uh, against uh, decreased competitions. And Roosevelt, as you know, is a famous trust buster who, in the course of his uh, time in office, uh, attempt to deal with many of those uh, of those, um, of those monopolies. Also, the Elkins Act, which is a uh, defense of public land, an attempt to take certain land, uh, bail, uh, take it off the market, so to speak, conserve it, prevent it from being turned into you know, natural resource markets in the area, uh, allow it to exist for other purposes, for later use, and perhaps for recreation and other things like that. So, those are some of the specific programs of the, of the Square Deal. What exactly is he hoping to achieve? So, I'd like to address is what are some of the things that he hopes to achieve with these programs. First of all, I think he wished to preserve capitalism. Uh, Roosevelt, at his rootiest being, despite being a progressive, still a believer in private property and capitalistic endeavor. But he saw in the trusts and the corruption and some of the problems that private industry was exhibiting at the time, a, a possibility that capitalism might be undermined. It might not be there for later uh, ambitious people to use to achieve things as, as Roosevelt felt he had. I he was not quite wealthy himself. Uh, he was afraid of radicalism. He was afraid of radicalism. Uh, keep in mind the politics of the, of the time, of the, uh, of the high uh, kind of uh, uh, attractiveness in certain areas of the world, of ideologies that Marxism and things like that, you know, some communitarian ideologies that Roosevelt wishes to keep uh, from coming to America because he doesn't agree with them, but he thinks that capitalism is going to be uh, unrestrained and continuing to be, uh, you know, have these problems, then uh, it's, it's not going to be good for capitalism. His uh, wishes to have the labor movement become uh, perhaps more controlled, less radicalized, more, uh, more willing to kind of sit down and uh, become a partner with business and hopes that by these reforms, uh, they will be offered the square deal, the chance to compete, the chance to be, uh, chance to do well on their own without wanting to, of course, take over the entire system and things like that. I think he links free enterprise and the preservation of capitalism also to patriotism and nationalism. Roosevelt had a passion, was as earlier this morning people discussed, the great desire to make America a huge power for us to go on our grand adventure to succeed in becoming the great power he thought we were. Uh, in a divided country, a class-driven country, uh, a country with uh, that type of feeling he did not feel would be a uh, strong power. He needed the working middle class to be behind uh, some of the wish things he wished to achieve for the country. Also, protection of the environment for the recreation, the strenuous life, uh, that uh, he himself would you know, go into the wilderness until he found his own strength. And then he wanted more people to do that, and he wanted that land available for other people to do the same. He found the beauty, of course, in nature, and like shoot animals and things like that. He saw that as kind of a proving ground for men uh, to be able to achieve their potential. So uh, he wanted to see that particular, uh, uh, what we're going to say. And I think, in a political sense, what he wanted, of course, was a strong middle class following. This was where he saw his potential support coming from. Up to this point, Roosevelt had dealt with a politics of his country and had a politics that was largely regional in quality, uh, regional divided by region, north, south, west. He wanted to create a national uh, constituency. Uh, he also wanted to have based on support for himself and his presidency. These programs would reach out to the people, get support for him. Previous to this, it had truly been a a partisan type of politics, the politics of patronage, the politics of parties, voters voting for the party first and the candidate second. Uh, Roosevelt, for the first time, offered them an attractive, uh, uh, charismatic figure with which to identify with outside of their own parties. If he was a Republican and a party man, but he wanted to have that sort of a following, not just people voting because they liked uh, the party. Uh, and he also really had the ability to deliver all this. He manipulated the mass media, he mass marketed himself, he was the president who first really, I think, realized that I can go out to the people. He also had a mass media that would allow him to do it, uh, the chance to reach out and develop this national constituency. And I think this is why he's a remarkable president, and why I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad that we have the symposium. And uh, thank you. So, <laughs> thank you, uh, Steve Doherty. Get right on to Gary Cummins. Gary Cummins is an associate uh, professor of geography and anthropology 
and uh, he's participated in, in like uh, Steve others in several of these symposia before. And today he's going to talk about Theodore and Gifford's big show and the development of the U.S. Forest Service here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an interest that has grown up on me. I didn't come to the Kansas State University as a Pinchot expert or a Roosevelt expert by any means, and I would quite claim expert status, but no doubt delving into this for the past four years, I've become increasingly interested in the Roosevelt family, uh, Theodore Roosevelt in particular, and his policies regarding conservation. And although he was undoubtedly a charismatic and uh, progressive president, a new kind of president, a new kind of man in that office that reshaped our concept of modern presidency, he didn't do this alone. And it was his allies, his carefully chosen allies in many cases, that helped him to facilitate his vision and also to formulate his vision. And I would say that would be true of uh, Gifford Pin Show. Uh, Pinchot and Roosevelt shared much in common. They weren't that far apart in age. They were about seven years of difference. Roosevelt born in 1858 and uh, Pinchot in 1865. They both, uh, we could argue, were patrician, coming from well-to-do, well-established families. Uh, they both were educated in some of the finer institutions, Harvard and Yale, respectively. And they both had a vision that encompassed embracing the common man and that common ideal of America as part of, I guess, we could say their progressivism and their ideal. They're also grounded in what I'd argue is modernity. Uh, the Australian uh, art critic and art historian Robert Hughes wrote a book back in 1980 called The Shock of the New. And in that book, he's arguing that where do we draw the line? Where do we start with modern movements? And he likes to trace it back to 1889 to the building of the Eiffel Tower, where an engineering marvel becomes also highly regarded as a, as a work of art and a kind of symbolism of achievement in a society uh, that we went from purely the aesthetic and the artistic to the celebration of engineering and the models of science. And encompassed within that is the idea that technology, in a sense, offers a promise. It's kind of ideological freedom from uh, the kind of labors that people had engaged in in the past. And in a sense, I think we see something of that spirit in progressivism when uh, the ideas that are ideas that are informed by science, better management strategies are embraced. And this would be true from the standpoint of Gifford Pinchot. And he came from a family who ironically could be argued to be lumber barons uh, from Milford, Pennsylvania. And, uh, uh, a regal house called Gray Towers. And his father, uh, James uh, Pinchot, had suggested to the relatively young uh, Gifford that he should perhaps pursue a career in forestry. And there really was no place to do that in the United States. Although he did attend Yale, he, as a postgraduate, he went to Nancy, France, and studied forest, forestry in France. And he was also influenced by a number of others, uh, the, the Brandis of, uh, in Great Britain, who was a pioneer in British forestry. One of the factors that Pinchot was exposed to was that many uh, kingdoms had essentially collapsed through exploitation of their natural resources. There's kind of a precursor to this to some extent in American history of, uh, 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 Marsh, um, Perkins Marsh, who um, was the uh, ambassador to Italy and to Turkey under the, during the Lincoln administration and wrote a book in 1864 uh, where he looks at man and nature and the exploitation of resources that Harvard University published 100 years later republishes this work. Um, one of the factors that Marsh looks at is that the New England landscape, in this case Vermont, uh, is decimated by locking operations, and, uh, bark tanning operations, and then later uh, the uh, char charcoal processing. And indeed, the, the forest is laid waste. And America, of course, is a bountiful place, and people move on to 
to the uh, Midwest, and then of course ultimately places like Minnesota and Wisconsin, and ultimately the Pacific Northwest. Fortunately, we had uh, visionaries like Pinchot who began to recognize that it was important that we protect these vital resources, that they could be sustainable resources. So at the conclusion of his studies in France, he returns to the United States, essentially hanging, hanging up a shingle and becoming a consultant and a professional forester. Fortunately, he had the economic resources to be able to do this. Uh, one of the places he works is at the Vanderbilt Forest in uh, Vanderbilt State in North Carolina, under uh, George Vanderbilt, and spent several years there managing that forest resource. And he becomes a consultant uh, to a commission that studies American forestry, which was housed in the Department of Interior. Um, moving from this position uh, under the Roosevelt administration, he enters this uh, uh, division of forestry, and he argues adamantly that this should be part of the Department of Agriculture. So they formally, in 1905, under the Roosevelt administration, move uh, the Department of Forestry Forestry becomes the U.S. Forest Service, and Gifford Pinchot becomes the chief forester. Uh, I have a few statistical pieces of data written down here about how this transformed from 1905 to 1910 during the five years of the, or I guess we can say the six years of the tenure of uh, Gifford Pinchot. It went from 1905, where there were 60 forest units comprising 56 million acres, to 1910, when there were 150 units comprising 172 million acres, so more than a threefold increase during this period. Uh, Pinchot was moved into this position from being asked to help develop a plan for western forests by the National Academy of Sciences under a National Forest Commission. Um, he um, becomes an avid advocate not just for the preservation of trees, but recognizing the various dimensions of the forest that it was, it was imperative for effective watershed management, that it was good for soil retention, uh, that the forest could be sustainable entities that could serve in many ways for the public good. And although he also was an advocate of, I guess you could say, uh, private enterprise, he didn't want to see these private resources exploited to such a rate that it wasn't going to serve in the common good. And I would argue that service to the common good was probably one of his primary themes. Uh, in this sense, he and Roosevelt, I think, saw eye to eye in many ways. The fervency of Pinchot's, uh, what might be described in his book, The Fight for Conservation, which was originally published in 1912, where in one essay, he argues that the United States has undergone three great crises. The first was the American Revolution itself, whether that was going to be a success. The second was the Civil War. And the third, as he says in this paragraph, in the third great crisis of our history, which has now come squarely upon us, the special interests and the thoughtless citizens seem to have united together to deprive the nation of the great natural resources of its great, I guess it's a, of the great natural resources, without which it cannot endure. This is the pressing danger now, and it is not the least to which our national life has been exposed. A nation deprived of liberty may win it, a nation divided may reunite, but a nation whose natural resources are destroyed must inevitably pay the penalty of poverty, degradation, and decay. So it was no less than the, of an imperative than what we had encountered in the Civil War and in the Revolution. He felt that this fight for conservation was critical and certainly was one of its leaders. In doing so, he encountered um, opposition from both sides of the spectrum. John Muir, who we explored to some extent in previous uh, symposia, um, was certainly an advocate for preservation of wild lands and was played a pivotal role in the establishment of several national parks and certainly had Roosevelt's ear, but not, he didn't serve as the close advisor that Pinchot did. Uh, on the other hand, so we have the preservationists that uh, Pinchot didn't openly embrace, and we also have those who were advocates of free market enterprise, which would go in and exploit these resources. He fell in the middle, um, arguing for his conservation, e conservation ethos, and I think in that sense uh, became arguably the major ally in terms of domestic natural resources policy. So I think I'll leave it at that and 
Thank you. All right, we don't have a lot of time. We've set the table here. Uh, I just want to start with Perry Arnold. Perry Arnold was here at our keynote last night. Not every one of you was able to hear him. If you were, if you weren't here, I'm so sorry because it was a terrific talk to a professor of, of political science at Notre Dame University. So you've been listening all day. Uh, give us a few comments about what you're hearing. Um, uh, this is kind of like asking, this is like action painting or ra random observations. Um, so, um, on, uh, let me say something about the early panel, just one observation on international affairs, then I'll say something in response to this panel. Um, what's talking about the early panel was in talking about um, uh, this version of American quasi colonialism uh, that we see. Uh, beginning really with Roosevelt um, coming out of the Spanish American War, um, that as we talked about the uh, comparisons to the American experience against the European experience, that one of the things that was not observed was the kind of factual, rational perception that Roosevelt had that this wasn't just like. Germany trying to get a piece of Africa, that he had a strategic sense that the United States needed control of a set of Caribbean islands and it needed control of the Philippines. And the reason was Japan in the Pacific and the Panama Canal in the Caribbean. So that he was thinking of these possessions or dependencies for very particular strategic reasons rather than just the kind of larger cultural, um, kind of cultural slash psychological aspirations of a great nation at the turn of the century. So that I think what's notable about the, the American case is that for all of its imperial ambition, perhaps at the turn of the century, it was a very different kind of imperial ambition that we see in Britain, um, Germany, France, it was Japan that would develop it a bit later. It was much more focused. In that sense, it was perhaps more rational and strategic. So, that on the earlier panel. Um, on this panel, um, the, um, I guess the, the, the I, I find it's the, it's the Gifford Pinchot piece that I think is, is we haven't talked about conservation really at all yet. And so I think that there's a lot that's very rich in this different picture of piece, that the, um, just a brief form observation, that the show Roosevelt relationship is extremely rich, it is really close. There's a, there's a observation that Roosevelt makes about Pinchot, that is both the meaning of Pinchot, but also celebrating of him. Roosevelt says of Pinchot that um, there's no man, that, and this is paraphrase, there's no man I more, more want to go to battle than Gifford Pinchot. <laughs> then he adds about Pinchot that there's nobody who will be more ready to give his own life at my direction than Gifford Pinchot. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's this kind of weird psychological vibrations between these two guys. And, um, and Pinchot was, a, was this really powerful figure in the administration that was certainly in tune with Roosevelt's propensities to conservation, but also was giving him enormous amounts of expertise. Precisely, I think, as you identify him. That is, Roosevelt had the ambition, but Pinchot had both the ambition and the expertise to create this dynamic conservation policy under Roosevelt. That one final point on Pinchot, and it is, of course, what Roosevelt saw as tasks, misuse, and um, um, firing of Pinchot, his, his um, abandonment of Pinchot in Taft's presidency that is perhaps the single most important thing that breaks Roosevelt from Taft and leads us to this kind of bizarre explosion in the 1912 election where Roosevelt breaks from the Republican Party, creates the Progressive Party, and runs perhaps wanting the presidency, but maybe wanting even more to, to, to destroy Taft which he did. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that that's worth talking about more. 
the well, conservation piece, the future piece. Well, there was a conflict over Alaskan lands, primarily gold fields in the Alaskan lands, by former Seattle mayor named Ballinger. And the, they, Ballinger, when he moved into office in the, in the interior, ultimately becoming secretary of the interior, uh, has three million acres of land removed from these public resources, which is an irritant in and of itself. But then later, there's disputes over you know, giving preferential treatment to um, access to coal fields, which um, Pinchot speaks out openly against. And ultimately, this results in his being fired during the Taft administration, which infuriates Theodore Roosevelt. And in part, some argue, may have led him to formulate the Bill Moose Party and run in opposition to Taft. So I, that's. I figured I'd focus on the uh, pin show during the presidency, but it's yeah, a continuation of that. Yeah, and uh, that suggests how important the show was. Yeah. And Pinchot was so appalled that he actually traveled to Europe to meet with TR at the end of his safari, so he'd get the first word in on what had gone wrong in that crisis. <laughs> we have some time for questions. This is the audience's chance, uh, and David Gottschalk hasn't had a chance yet to field questions, so let's begin here. Well, just happen to have one for Dr. Gottschalk. What is, do you have any thoughts on the, the Lily White um, character of the, of the Progressive Party in 1912 and, and you know, the rejection of the, of the black delegates? And more broadly, do you have any thoughts on how come the Progressives didn't um, make common cause with blacks? It seems like they have a, a natural community of interest, but it, it never developed. Why didn't the Bulls progressives embrace African Americans? Use the mic. Okay. He'll, he'll get it on. Yeah, he'll, he'll get it. But, you know, I, I guess uh, I guess regarding 1912 and the Lily Whites and the Progressive Party, obviously that was something that angered W. B. Du Bois very much. Was his attempt, right, to encourage Roosevelt to really emphasize the importance of black rights and also to seek, seek back black delegates. I don't think, though, among other, you know, in, in Du Bois's autobiography, it plays a very, a very large role. But among other progressives, I don't think the racial issue was as important to them in many ways. It wasn't something that most of them paid attention to outside of the NAACP. The point of my question is, I wonder why not? I mean, it seems to me that they have a, a, lot, of, a lot of common interests disfranchised blacks and the disfranchised poor, disfranchised regular people. So do you have any thoughts about why this coalition didn't form? Well, please hold the mic about four inches. Sure, sure. To make what, it so much easier for Dustin. Well, I guess it's interesting because, you know, if you look at the South, progressives, progressivism starts out as a movement primarily for whites, you know, that in fact, in many ways, blocks African American progress. I think that Tom Watson and the populace really attempt to bring the two races together around a platform of reform received in the South, you know, so much hatred and went down the defeat so quickly that I think that served as an example to other people of the difficulty of doing it. Um, you know, so I think in some ways there wasn't a sense that biracialism was the path by which you could get things done after the fall of the populace. And, um, you know, I think that both for Theodore Roosevelt, I think that race relations were important to him. I think Indian policy was important to him. But I think, and you know, I'm not, I'm, I know more about African Americans than I know about Theodore Roosevelt, but my sense is, that what William T. Hagen said about his Indian policy is probably similar to his African American policy, that Theodore Roosevelt knew a lot about the issue, but he wasn't that wasn't necessarily his largest priority at that time. And you know, I don't think that the African Americans were really, I mean, I, I think that the issue of race informed his policies and it informed his ideology, but I don't think that he was really committed, obviously to the racial issue, and I don't think that was of central importance to him. Thank you. Microphones. 
hold them about four inches away and try not to use that hand for gesturing if you can. Because <laughs> it's really hard for Dustin to try to keep this on. Go ahead. Can I say one thing? Yes, of course. That there was an argument uh, in 1912 amongst the Progressive Party leadership on exactly this issue, and there was a minority voice that you, who's, would resonate with your view apparently. And Jane Addams, the, the great social worker from Chicago, was the spokesman for precisely the argument that the Progressive Party must speak to the issues of African Americans. And she was overruled by enormous numbers. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of progressivism throughout, I think David's pointing at this, is that throughout the history of progressivism, it's particularly inattentive to black issues. And it's related to the, to the growth of Jim Crow laws about voting in the South. Keep in mind that, that progressivism is really interested in um, sanitizing the voting process, which made it very easy to then excise the poor, the black, from the, the, the ballot box. So they're not always good guys. Go ahead. I think, I think it also has to do with why I'm this the right way. I think uh, progressivism was also about the end of patronage, which was the way lower middle class people could perhaps get a chunk of government employment. And so I, I don't know if progressivism was a lower class movement. It seemed like more of a middle class movement. In the North, I think most of the African Americans were still in the South, had no political efficacy. So maybe there was no utility in kind of backing the progressive movement for them. Let's take a couple more questions here. Who has a question for any or all members of our panel? We're talking about domestic policy in the era of Roosevelt. Joe. I'm interested in the populist movement of today, the Tea Party uh, movement. Uh, how would Roosevelt have looked on the Tea Party? How would Roosevelt have looked on the Tea Party? Oh, yeah. Anyone who wishes to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look, as I said last night to a question similar to that, a counterfactual, we can't be wrong. Right. So, that, so I, I, I would guess quite disparagingly. Um, um, I mean, Roosevelt is a man of, uh, of elite education, aristocratic background, um, thoughtfulness, relatively high culture, and I think you would see none of those values that he prized in the Tea Party movement. Um, besides, and, uh, nor perhaps even the respect for facticity, if I might point for it. <laughs> so, well, plus, Roosevelt is pro-government. Um, right. He's an anti-Jeffersonian, he's a Hamiltonian, he believes government is an yeah. essential yeah. tool. Yeah, uh, on, on that point that Clay's making, um, uh, Roosevelt would, in letters and in his published writings, he would go on at some length about how Jeffersonian, Jeffersonianism um, is, uh, was, was a bane of American history. Um, all this nonsense about decentralization, etc. Hamilton got it right. No limited government for Roosevelt. No, he loved government. He loved government, well, he wasn't afraid. He believed in the power of government to do good. And I think that, you know, he would obviously want government to be efficient, and government to be effective in what they did, but he certainly did not believe in eliminating government from the daily affairs of Americans. I remember, I mean, Jefferson's constitutional theory was that he, the government could only do those things that were specifically enumerated in the Constitution of the United States. He like broke that theory from time to time. But, but um, Roosevelt's constitutional theory was the government could do anything that wasn't specifically prohibited by the Constitution. These are diametrically opposed views of government. The Tea Party is, I believe, a distortion of Jefferson's point of view, but it's on the Jeffersonian end of the spectrum. Other questions? Yes, here. African-American leaders ever think that Roosevelt was playing them for strategic reasons by inviting Booker T to the White House and so on. Yeah, I don't get that sense, and I think that it, I think they, I'm, okay, let me back, go backward. I would say that Roosevelt kind of did it without realizing the significance of it at the time, and I think a number of them realized that he didn't know what he was getting into. 
I think that somebody like Du Bois was probably very distrustful of Roosevelt. And the tricky thing when looking at African Americans' reactions during this period is like all political reactions, they use Roosevelt often to push their own agenda. And so they turn Roosevelt into something that he wasn't. In some of the cartoons I showed, for example, they emphasized how Roosevelt was against segregation and was a really strong advocate of putting an end to disfranchisement, where he wasn't really that publicly involved in those issues. So I, so I think it's really hard to read African Americans, and I think when we quote from African Americans, because they're so disempowered, they often use language, and they often use public opinions that where they try to push an agenda and turn Roosevelt into something that he wasn't necessarily. Um, I don't think that, and the other thing too is because African Americans are disfranchised during this time period, somebody, a lot of black leaders aren't that interested in politics beyond the complicated nature of, of patronage and things like that. So, so, I, so I think that they saw Roosevelt as a potential opportunity to turn things for the better in the long term, but I don't think they, I, I don't think Du Bois or leaders like him really thought that, that he was necessarily from the beginning, you know, a way out for African Americans. But I think they came to embrace them as having potential problem for promise. David, let me ask a follow-up question about Brownsville that I was thinking about while you were lecturing. The Brownsville incident occurs in August of 1906. Roosevelt um, uh, dismisses all 167 of the African American soldiers. Several investigations occurred at the time that showed that it, it was very unlikely that they had been responsible for this. Uh, he was challenged by members of his own party. He was challenged by the press, by African American leaders. When you read the literature, it looks as if at some point in this process, Roosevelt realized that he had really overreacted, but he wouldn't back down. Why do you suppose he couldn't at any point in this process say, wow, let's pull back and maybe find a compromise and exonerate some people here? That's, that's a, a really interesting question, and I would say the striking thing is, is that part of his support for black civil rights were these issues where he got backed into a similar corner. If you look at, for example, he didn't anticipate the public reaction to Washington. He didn't anticipate the South's response to the appointment of William Crum. And he didn't really anticipate what would happen in the Cox situation. In all those three situations, he dug in his heels. So it's interesting that in some ways, the most symbolic triumphs for African Americans were periods when he really dug in his heels and then Brown spills a, a similar reaction. Reverse yeah. position. Yeah. But he got to act at, at that Gridiron Club meeting you talked about with Foraker, they got into a slathering shouting match, and it was one of the most undignified moments in his presidency. Yeah, I think it was just impossible for him to make to admit that he made an error of judgment. And after a while it probably just escalated out of control where to go back on his decision would paint him in a bad line. Questions? Am I missing you? Amy, tell us more. We were so sorry to cut you short. You have so much to say about this. For one thing, there was, I mean, there was a scandal involving White and that, that whole firm that did the remake of the White House. Edith Roosevelt was heavily involved in this. How much of the White House when we go to it today is, 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 um, is the Roosevelt remake? I think, you know, the general White House decoration, you know, the, with the classical revival, um, it's really survived the last hundred years. There were, there were a lot of physical changes. Certainly the uh, Truman renovation, you know, that, that took place not because the carpets were ugly, but because the floors were falling apart. And, and so during the Truman administration, they literally had to gut the house. And, and you can see pictures where there's a metal framing inside the building holding the walls up. And you know, it, they also made changes at that time, like adding the bomb shelter and things uh, for the president. Um, what's interesting is that after all that work is, is they did basically put back the 1902 house. And, and so in terms of, of the room's decoration, it, it, it is very close. Now, obviously, every president chooses his own colors, and 
Um, the carpets change and the curtains change and paint changes, but in terms of the, the structural framework or skeleton of the house, it's very much the Roosevelt house, I think. And just another question about Sagamore. You know, we see that picture, those, those images of the bison on the wall. We North Dakotans, I hope you don't think we're parochial, but he shot his first ever buffalo right here. And we wonder which one it is. Do you happen to know? <laughs> we, we we're told as part of the mythology that that buffalo head is in the north room. Do we know which one he shot here? Yeah, I bet actually if we look at the catalog record, we would know if it's the one on the left or the one on the right. It, he shot both of them in, in the Dakotas, I think. Uh, but we do have his buffalo head, yes. Well, we'd uh, like that one back. Sorry. The Roosevelt Center here. Sorry. Alone, perhaps. I'm not committed to going uh, to the <laughs> It's like the Elgin Marbles. He removed it from North Dakota. We just wanted that. I think it's sort of different than the Elgin Marbles. Okay. Yeah, back here, yes. Was the first actual press room. Before this, the uh, you know newspaper reporters had sort of loitered on benches or the spare chair around the building and just uh, not had a place to, to gather. And so they, they created a press room where they could actually like sit in out of the rain and drink coffee, and do their job. Um, in terms of, of in Washington specifically, the, the changes were very well received in terms of people who had come to the White House previously and never gotten their coat back or, uh, you know, waited five hours for their carriage to be brought up to the door so they could go home. You know, there's a lot of uh, conversations about how well the public perceptions ran and, and how well uh, the, the state affairs ran. And there was a lot of commentary from ambassadors and, and people like that, their staff. So, and, and I think, you know, for, for most Americans, there was a great deal of pride in how the building looked, that, that suddenly it's like, you know, sort of worthy of a world stage, worthy of an empire, that you have this, this uh, house that represents them to the world. And I think it's funny for Americans, probably we, we would think that the capital would be the symbol because that, that represents our government. But uh, for a lot of people in Europe, it's still focusing on an individual and on the presidency. I know this isn't your field, White House history, but isn't it true that Edith was the perfect person to do this because she was exceedingly frugal and she was not a spender? No, no, Mrs. Roosevelt was very frugal and, and she counted every penny, uh, both of, of her own expenditures and of the White House expenditures. It's actually interesting that, that there were times uh, in the remodeling process where she felt that different pieces of furniture were needed that uh, were not budgeted for and she purchased them. Uh, and at the end of uh, the term, when they were leaving the office, there were one or two pieces that she had purchased that she decided to take with her. With her own funds she had purchased. And, and uh, you know, some of the, shall we say, yellow newspapers in Washington said, oh, Mrs. Roosevelt is stealing furniture, <laughs> which offended her immensely. And she refused to take her sofa. She refused to take uh, some bookcases that she had had made and paid for herself. And uh, she was really offended by that. Um, President Taft very gracefully followed up, and he paid to have copies of the bookcases made and sent her the originals. And he sent her her little sofa, which is in the north room, where you can sit and look at the buffalo. Under our buffalo, that's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta 
race riot or the similarity of these kinds yes. of things. Did anybody ever figure that out? The question is between the Russian, the comparison between the Russian pogroms and anti-Semitism and American race. Oh, oh, definitely, that would definitely be the case. They call it the Atlanta race riot in American Kieshnev. And in addition to that, you know, a lot of the early leaders of the NAACP, a number of them were Jewish. Include, they were either Jewish or they were socialists. And for, for example, William Walling, and um, William Walling, who was really played the engine, he, he was really the engine behind the scenes, for the founding of the NAACP had written on Russia and in, other, in a number of magazine articles, his wife was writing a novel based on a series of pogroms that took place in Gomel or Homel. I think it, it's spelled with a G and it's also spelled with an H and I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But she had written, Anna Strunsky had written a lot on that and they were both very committed to ending those riots. And when riot, race riots started taking place in the United States, they were afraid that the United States would fall apart like Russia was falling apart. And they embraced the NAACP as a way to battle racism, but also violence that they thought would lead to a revolution like what was taking place in Russia. So there was a very strong connection that was made. And it's also striking that just as what took place in Russia a lot of times the people who were targeted among African Americans were those who had saved money and were achieving and there was a lot of economic jealousy in addition to ethnic hatred towards them. So there's a very clear connection and I'm actually giving a presentation on that in LA in two months. So. And the Miller uh, Fillmore Jubilee. Yeah. <laughs> but let me ask you one last question we won't get another chance, David. Yeah, you know, at the very end of his life, Roosevelt, there's this weird event that happened after the East St. Louis riots where Roosevelt's on stage in New York with Samuel Gompers, and Samuel Gompers, the great labor leader, is defending the white backlash against African Americans in East St. Louis and saying that th these workers were really only trying to protect their labor, this is an infiltration of undesirable alien workers who drive down wages and so on, rhetoric we hear from time to time today. But Roosevelt went nuts, and he went up and shook his fist. What do you, what do you make of that little scene at the end there of his life? Well, I think that's, a, you know, that's obviously a, a very complex issue, and it's hard. One of the biggest issues, I think, and that's really emphasized in Dalton's book, is the degree to which Roosevelt's racial program was a factor of political possibility versus what he really believed. And obviously, once he no longer is president, you know, in the 19 teens, he has an opportunity, I think, for, I, I think the fact that he no longer faced the political pressures that he placed when he was president and perhaps some regrets about what he had done with Brownsville, that I think he was freer to move towards supporting African Americans more. And I think he was especially afraid of racial violence, like a lot of Americans were, because he feared that it would threaten America and, you know, threaten democracy and threaten civilization in many ways. I think he saw it as, as, as a potential rise of anarchy in the United States. So, I mean, at this sort of last moment of his life, he's, he's being authentically offended by the notion that we could defend anti-black activities in East St. Louis. Right. And I think he was, you know, I think he was very against violence and he's spoken out against violence very early on at the same time, especially in the early 1900s, he was convinced that African-American rapists posed a threat to white women, I think in part because he was captive to a lot of the publicity and a lot of the news articles that, that, were, truck, that were pumping that up when it really wasn't the case. Perry Arnold, Stephen Doherty, Gary Cummins, David Godshock, Amy Verone, we thank all of you for this terrific <laughs>